Hello there and welcome to Pike and Shot Campaigns. I'm your host, PPG Chu, and welcome to what might be a Let's Play series, however more likely a Let's Try series. Today we're taking a look at a recently released game from Matrix Games and Slytherin once again. And Pike and Shop's camp uh, campaigns here is a, I believe it's a game set in more or less the Renaissance period. Honestly, it's not uh, a period I'm particularly knowledgeable about. But uh, during this time, uh, to the best of my knowledge again, um, it was the time where the one of these some of these Spanish squares came into prominency in the sense that it was a bit of a transition between medieval warfare and kind of uh, well you know musket warfare I, I would say Napoleonic and and things kind of in that general time uh, so that said it's a very interesting period of time um, not very kind of well established in, in games of course so I think it's a very interesting venture. Um, before we start the series, uh, we're you know taking the, a look at the tutorial videos, as I've said inside the video title. Um, one thing that I need to clarify is kind of how purchasing this game um, works, in the sense that there's Pike and Shot, there's an expansion to Pike and Shot called Tear Hole and 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 uh, and salvo i think and then there's also pike and shot campaigns so that said this is if you will the sequel to the original game sort of um and you know kind of that that said uh, i wanted to clarify on what happens here so pike and shot is the original game uh they released an expansion for the game which is a collection of like, for example, new units and new scenarios. And they also had Pike and Shot Campaigns, the latest release, which if you buy it, it includes the, the other portion of the content at, I believe, a slightly um, cheaper price than if you purchased, say, the original game and all. The new thing that Pike and Shot Campaigns, in addition to including everything that was previously released, is the Campaigns section over here. So not drawing kind of comparisons with the total war series um how the game or how these campaigns work is that you play on an overarching kind of map of, a, of an area in europe um you have various different troops allotted to you uh you fight uh with with what is effectively your your persistent force on these maps and in general the game kind of works off of that angle there so that says um okay what about the original game and what about stuff like that well, in that case, you always get access to multiplayer, you always have an editor to make your own scenarios, uh, you always have a quick battle generator, and the main camp or the main uh, release for the game has this historical section here. So I believe inside the store, they specifically mention inside the original game that you do get campaigns. And that is in the sense that you get these three things, the, the 30 Years of War, the English Civil War, and the Italian Wars. Right, so if I open one of these up, these are actually packs, if you will, of linear um, battles, historical battles, set within this time frame. And while these are a campaign, if you will, in the sense that they deal with this, with a with a particular conflict at a particular time, they are independent scenarios that you can kind of play on and off there. So, um, yeah, that that is one thing. And the other thing is that, of course, this one, the, the tier to salvo one, is the one that you get if you uh, purchase the the um, the the expansion there. And again, you get all of these if you purchase uh, Pike and Shot campaigns. And for people who own the original game and the expansion, you get a discount, and I think it's pretty hefty in the sense that, it's, um, for me at least, uh, using Canadian prices, somewhere around the 85% mark. So if I if I were to to purchase the game, it would cost us it would cost me like seven seven twenty nine. I think uh, was the price that I was quoted. So yeah, overall, that's that's kind of how you know to clarify anything for for people who are interested in this that's kind of the basis of it so let's get to the point let's jump into the tutorials and learn how to play the thing okay so dropping this back to tutorial mission one let's start off with uh well somewhere in germany 1640 Right, so the game, um, we've, we've seen something familiar to, to this in the past. It's, uh, I believe, based on the same um, engine that runs the Battle Academy games, which are uh, these World War II games. So yeah, it's fairly interesting. 
And how the game generally works here is that once you kind of deploy into a battle, the game will give you a summary about, you know, the background to it, kind of what forces your enemy has. And uh, usually you get the choice to choose kind of where and what units you deploy with. The thing being that uh, this being the tutorial mission, it is very kind of uh, limited for, for, for the players' sake. And well, now we can jump into the battle uh, nice and properly. So uh, let's just begin. So uh, this is oddly enough, a very complex game for what it's worth. So we'll try to go slowly through a couple of things and I apologize if it's uh, it's a little too slow for some people. So welcome to Pike and Shot tutorial. Welcome to the Pike and Shot tutorial. You are in command of a Protestant German army in the 30 years of war and will be fighting a, a small battle against a Catholic band uh, or a Catholic Imperial army. You can move around the battlefield uh, through the mouse and all that. I'm not going to read that part because it's fairly standard. We can click the end of the turn button over here to end the turn. And overall, typically battles will have the objective of either just kind of breaking one army by making the majority of its units route or something other such. And one thing to note, is you can press the spacebar to get rid of those notifications and you'll see a lot of those come up. So that is a very useful, uh, well, uh, thing to note. Right, so let's take a look at generally, you know, how, how interactions are, are happen, happen inside the game. So um, the game will tell us right away here a little bit about how we get to know our different units. If we mouse over our different units, we can see their different stats. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to cancel this word. I'm going to get rid of this menu here, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about what it uh, it does here. So A, firstly, um, going along with what it says here for about the units, the standard unit for the game is these pike and shot squares. So these are made up of, uh, well, somebody realized that, I mean, if you combine pikemen and a whole bunch of these musketeers, you make a pretty effective unit in the sense that it stops cavalry. And well, with the, with the, with the sheer amount of people you have in these squares, they're, they're little mobile fortresses, if you will. So yeah, the game will tell us that A, um, these units have a varying amount of pikemen and a varying amount of, uh, of musketeers, typically the backbone of our army, and they'll typically put out significant firepower and yeah, more or less your generic unit. So um, they're more effective at, at two squares, but they can shoot at four squares. I'm sorry, I don't have the, the exact distances as to how, um, kind of how the, where or at what ranges the game happens at. So that's that. And taking a look at the bottom panel here, we have a few different things uh, or different statistics or, you know, different stats to talk about. So a, each unit in the game will be given a rating for close combat, for shooting, and for armor. So the idea being that, uh, well, you know, that's fairly self-explanatory. In addition to that, each unit will have a certain amount of action points to move around and do stuff with. Um, they'll have a different type of unit, and they'll have a, a certain amount of units where, you know, people, virtual people, if you will, present within the unit. So this square has 505 people. And like I said, it's mixed up of, uh, it's, it's, it's a mixed unit of muskets and pike. That part will be, cut, uh, will be important later on because there's a fair amount of different variations in units. So for example, some units might have only muskets and no pikes or, you know, kind of the exact opposite. Um, that, that part really matters in determining kind of uh, how, how they interact with cavalry and the such like that. And they're steady, indicating their morale is at, uh, at its best for now. So we'll cancel that little blurb for later. One of the important things to note is that you can control click on your units to get a detailed briefing about them. And this will tell you more about, uh, say for example, some more stuff about, you know, kind of how, how well they shoot, how well they, they smack against different units and just in general, some different things. So taking a look at this again, um, the top part gives us a nice little description. Uh, these two parts shooting and troop type we've already summarized. So taking a look at impact and melee, um, that, those come into come, come into effect uh, during during melee phases. So the the point the POA there stands for kind of point of advantage or, or something of the such like that, and effectively means um, kind of how much to get towards, I believe, their, their close combat rating in this case uh, for kind of fighting mounted units like that. So again, very helpful tools for to, to get us up to brief with these different units. And that said, we'll take a look at some of our other units going down the line. 
Right, so we have some medium guns here. They can engage uh, units at long ranges. And the main thing about them is that they don't actually do a lot of damage. They, they more or less are there to do morale damage. So yeah, quite effective for that. Not so much effective for anything else. Um, they can turn and fire, but they can't necessarily move uh, around the map, just given the time frame of the battle. Uh, moving forward from there, we have cavalry. Cavalry comes into a few different forms. Um, here we have some veteran horse, which kind of is a, you know, it's a very general term and inside the, the historical scenarios here. Uh, later on, we'll be faced with very specific types of cavalry. So we have some of those over there. We also have some some more veteran horse over here. And we also have a skirmish user uh, unit called Commander Shots over here. So. Um, the cavalry functions, you know, as you as you might imagine, they're often armed with either pistols, uh, carbines, or lances. So yeah, stuff like that. Uh, commanded shot here. These guys are a skirmish infantry in the sense that they're very light. Um, they don't take as much damage when being shot at, and overall, they uh, well. They, they, they're, they're very good against kind of, well, contesting and just in general harassing the enemy, doing some disor uh, morale and disorder damage, like such. And yeah, overall, a lot of stuff like that. So, now that we've uh, been accustomed to our, our troops, we can take a look at the enemy lines as well. And what they have here is largely the same. They have some raw piking shots, so inexperienced uh, squares, um, like, like ours, but of course, out of minor... Um, at a, at a minor rate, and they also have some just regular horse, uh, well, you know, cavalry, again, very simple tutorial, these guys are exactly just a lower veteran seed version of our units, but the main thing is that they have a hill here, and like this game says, if the difference between two tiles fighting uphill, if you will, if the difference is above 75, um, the advantage is, uh, yeah, there will be, you know, a bit of an advantage for, for the people defending or, you know, on top of the hill there. And over here, they have another cavalry unit. These guys, and again, uh, one of the best, one of the things about the game is that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a historical game, learning about kind of the different troops here. So they have some of these rifle armed, you know, carbine armed, uh, yeah, cavalry over here. And these guys, they're 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 kind of a raiding type of uh, unit. And again, much like uh, the the skirmish infantry, they're they're used to soften up enemy foot infantry. Um, if they're moving on kind of lightly on on areas where regular horse infantry might not be able to to get around to. Um, they're good against chasing down skirmishers, but for the most part, again, uh, used for for the fact for 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 their ability to kind of disorganize these bands of uh, pike and shot. So right, we can we can get our people to advance now, and the general strategy for this mission will be very very simple. We're just going to advance and we're pushing. We're going to push forwards and we're going to see how much damage we can do, and just in general learn about the general phasing for the game. So as you see here, I'm moving my guys up and getting the cannons because they can't move to open fire upon our enemy lines. And as the battle goes on, more of these things will appear. As time goes on, uh, our units will move from that steady stash disorder status down to disrupted, to fragmented, to uh, routed, where, you know, panicked, as they say. So what that is all about is kind of uh, how, how well organized and how and in what shape your, your men are, loosely speaking. So um, I, I believe this is to highlight, for example, for with these medieval battlefields, uh, you know, you really don't have a lot of control over kind of what your forces are actually doing in the grand scheme of things. You're kind of, you know, you're, you're, you're getting your troops to do uh, enact these maneuvers, but you got to give them time and uh, you got to see how uh, things kind of pan out. So that said, disrupting your troops at times kind of matters more than simply doing damage or even kind of engaging them in melee. And I think that's kind of the, the right perspective you need to come into things with. And that said, we'll be trying our best to say, for example, use these commanded shots or use our infantry to put down lines of fire, despite the fact that, you know, you might only cause, say, 20, you know, maybe even 10 losses for a group of 200. And this is because, again, disrupting them is critical. Uh, the only exception might be over here. I might make a charge with our veteran horse here. I'll advance some two tiles for next turn against these guys, simply because the pistol armed veteran horse are much more effective uh, in close combat than these uh, Akri boozers uh, there. Thing is that, I think at the time, yeah, like, uh, like it says here, um, they charge in, they fire their pixels at point blank, kills them off then. Uh, but 
at the same time that doesn't leave them an answer to to infantry units so so yeah good against cavalry a good anti-cavalry unit not so much uh good against infantry and yeah that's that Right, so we've handled this flank over here, so let's move over to the hill area over here. I've got my cannons to fire up on their horse, and it's a good thing that this that disrupted them, because that allows us to make that this comparison over here. So if you notice, this disrupted unit has a combat value of uh, 42. Um, they'll have the same armor rating, just you know, simply because it doesn't really make sense for yeah yeah that to get damaged. But as you see here, I mean, doing a little bit of disruption, which is simply with those cannons, cuts down their organ, cuts, cuts down their combat power by by a ton. So that said, we'll make our we'll try to make the fullest advantage we can about uh, kind of doing some some morale damage like that and clearing up uh, forces. And in general, uh, the two things that you'll be doing inside this game is that you'll be moving your troops, you'll be firing them, or you'll be turning them to, to kind of face the enemy. Uh, one of the things is that your troops move at a very, very slow rate. Um, so, so you've got to give them ample time, you've got to kind of plan ahead for this. Um, and what I what and the first time I played this scenario, what I wanted to do was I wanted to get a cavalry unit to kind of go through here, you know, use two to lock them up uh, in melee with these two, and get one to turn and it, to hit them from from the rear end. What was really surprising about that was that it, it it was actually a three turn maneuver than what you might imagine it being kind of a two turn type of thing, which does matter, of course, in the long run. Right. So the game has a couple of different phases, and like it says here, um, depending on whether or not your troops have shot during your turn or the, or the enemy's turn, there will be a period for the units to enact their own judgment and to fire off shots as, um, as, they, as they kind of please. And then there will be a melee phase. There will actually be two melee phases because, uh, well, the game kind of goes back and forth from your, from your enemy's point of view to your point of view. And, well, here we see your first melee. So how melee works is that melee is enacted. Your units kind of you know charge at each other, where one charges at at another, if you will. Uh, they they come into compact at impact. Impact is a special round that uh, depending on your units. So for example, things like lancers may be more effective at that than they than they are at you know uh, actual melee melee combat. And yeah, so the game kind of goes back and forth through here. Goes back to melee mode. And in general, there will be, uh, if you will, two melee phases, two residual shooting phases, and one enemy turn between your turn to your next turn. So yeah, melee matters uh, a lot be just simply because of the fact that it ha technically happens three times. I mean, you charge them, uh, melee phase one, and then melee phase twice, uh, two. So that's one thing. And right, so these two units are locked in combat. Um, the thing is that this is, uh, this is the unit that isn't disrupted, so they have quite a lot of combat power. Still a bit less than our unit, and that's just kind of the nature of the, the tutorial, but then again, they are on a hill. And the other thing is that you can't fire on units um, that are engaged in melee, which makes sense. They're a blob with your other units. So that's one thing. The other thing is that, again, you know, kind of sluggish uh, troops. Um, if you turn your guns to face an enemy, to fire at them fully, uh, it'll take a turn, or it'll, it'll take up all the, the movement points. So that said, um, they uh, I, I've elected to switch over here, seeing as how we're very, very likely to win the hill fight. So you can have multiple units engage in, in melee at the same time, but at the same time, uh, over here, A, this isn't a priority target, um, seeing as how this unit is, yeah, yeah, in, a, in, in the grand scheme of things, where, you know, on a real battlefield, they wouldn't turn to charge this unit, that just simply wouldn't make sense, they would charge here, so we can knock this moon over, they'll hit them, um, they didn't, won't do a lot of damage, but that'll engage them in melee again, and over here we can get a second unit to participate and now what you see here is <clears throat> the the different morale states so now that we charge them again uh, from looks of it this unit uh, impacting them did dealt them a lot of damage so now instead of being disrupted they're fragmented which even further lowers their combat power so currently they dropped from 10 or uh, 100 to 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 around you know 40 50 to 14 so yeah as you see the organization is very very critical and the game kind of continues from there so again 
Uh, this little, I, I call it a candy corn symbol, uh, tells you how much of your, your line infantrymen can, can shoot um, at this enemy formation. So for example, at times, um, if say, if I, you know, I'll, I'll do this as an example, it's not the optimal move, of course. If I turn or, you know, I can't even shoot then, or there we go, that works too. In this case, only half or a quarter of my people can shoot. So yeah, they do drastically lower uh, damage. But anyhow, it doesn't really matter much. Once our veteran horse impacts them, they, they that should chew them out for, for a whole lot of damage. And right over here, let's get the trade-off started. We typically want to be in two ra uh, two tiles to, to do maximum damage. Try to bait out some fire over here. And yeah, your, the enemy forces will have a chance to react. They're not going to bite, so we're going to move forwards. Put down some fire like that. Let them fire, move right next to them, fire again. And again, I want to disrupt these guys and hopefully then afterwards kind of lock them up in a melee charge. Right, so again, phases go into melee, the melee uh, brawl continues. Right, and depending on troop quality, the terrain, different things will happen. And here, here's the first route. So we've broken the enemy on this, uh, where this particular unit. And what will happen is that the victors of our uh, the victors of the the little melee here will actually pursue the uh, the enemy. They won't try to reform right away. So that said, uh, if you commit to a melee, I mean, you you do have to deal with the fact that your the the pursuing band of, of troops is locked up. They'll be busy despite the fact that the enemy is already broken. So that said, these two troops will chase this unit around for a while. Um, but the thing is that they also have a chance to, I believe, charge at enemies kind of, you know, towards their front um, that they see as viable targets. They won't, you know, turn 360 degrees or around and, you know, charge another unit, but they'll, 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 they'll pick, uh, they'll, they'll try to pick out a natural target for them to charge. And again, as you see, uh, they're charging, they're running, stuff like that. And I believe the... Uh, the horse over here, they take some gradual damage if they're broken. Another melee phase. And this is kind of where um, it's it's handy to keep your hand on the spacebar. It's just simply because of the, the sheer amount of uh, notifications you get from melees. So I believe if there is one target within the front three tiles here of one of our our pursuing units, we do have a chance to maybe engage this pike and shot with this veteran horse, where actually I think both of these have a slight chance to pursue this, uh, or to, to change the direction of their charge over there. So we'll see what happens. Over here, I'll continue to get them to fire at range. And yeah, that's what I want. I want them to be disrupted. Uh, hopefully our cavalry will take up the uh, the fight there that was quite a good barrage didn't do anything though which kind of sucks and i guess we'll get that unit to just sneak around ideally i want to break that unit but uh, nothing is happening right so let's see what happens to the pursuing bands there we go so again, this unit's charging uh, something within their pursuit. Targets the fragmented band, which is a uh, well, target that we had wanted them to go to. But sometimes, I mean, they don't. So uh, yeah, you gotta keep out. Uh, you know, you can't really count on that, I suppose, is, is the way I'd put it. All right, and typically, as soon as you get the first disruption, they'll break soon enough. Okay, so here, yeah, we have a pretty good chance of, you know, kind of continuing the charge. It's natural to kind of switch between those two targets. So there we go. Managed to route the uh, the entire the entirety of the enemy force, and of claimed victory. So overall, you know, not uh, you know, 44 losses, I suppose. You know, if you, eh, I, I don't know. It's a medieval game. I suppose you can count the food that's losses. Um, and overall, yeah, we've done quite a bit of damage to them. So, I hope you've enjoyed the first video inside our series here, and hope you'll be back for episode 2 of the tutorial on Pike and Shot.